community work with the Methodist Church. Oh, recording in progress. Um, and so that's finished now and I'm still in Gateshead and I'm still doing various bits of community work, but I am in a bit of a time of reflection after that's ended. So I'm just going to use this space very selfishly to share some of the reflections that have been mulling over in my head about being part of Gateshead Poverty Truth Commission. Now, I know there are some people in this room who know exactly what a Poverty Truth Commission is, probably more than I am, but I wonder if there are also some people here who don't know what a Poverty Truth Commission is at all or might not even have heard of one before today. So I wonder, um, for those of you who've got cameras on, um, could you just show me on a scale of one to 10 or zero to 10, where zero is, you know, nothing about Poverty Truth Commissions and 10 is you've got a PhD in the process of a Poverty Truth Commission. With your fingers, could you show me where you are? Oh. Not bad. Now, Jim, I can only see one hand. Ah, that went from a three to an eight. OK, I don't see any zeros, but I do see some below fives. So um, in response to that, I'm going to begin by talking about what a Poverty Truth Commission is. Um, Poverty Truth Commission started in Glasgow over 10 years ago now. And it's a process, really, although it's a process that's very much people led. I mean, it brings together two groups of people. One being a group of people from a specific place. So in um, Gateshead, example, you've guessed it, a group of people from across Gateshead who know what it is to live at the sharp end of poverty. Um, and that's a group of quite diverse people. In Gateshead, we have people who would say that their experience of poverty was because of their mental health and was actually quite recent and before it lived quite a middle class existence. So we had some people for whom their poverty was because they had experienced the asylum seeking process in the UK. Some of people's poverty was tied up in their experience of disability um, and the way that the benefit system often works to um, <laughs> commit acts of violence on people who um, have disabilities. Um, and yeah, a whole other range, this group of people who, for a variety of reasons and a variety of experiences, know what it is to experience poverty. So that makes a part of Poverty Truth Commission. And actually, that's the group that begins it. They get together, they have conversations, share experiences, commonalities and differences, and then present some of their stories at a launch event. And there are a couple of people here who are at the launch event of Gates and Poverty Truth Commission in 2020. I'm looking at you, Pat and Jim, at least you two. Um, and after that, the other half of the commission joined those people. And the other half are a group of people that often those that lived experience of poverty would never be in a room with. And they are people um, with power and influence in the system. An equal number of people who like often make decisions that affect the people with lived experience in an area. So in Gateshead, we had, to be honest, an equally diverse group of people. We had someone who was very senior in Newcastle Building Society. So sat within like the economic realm of the Northeast. We had, um, the director of the Baltic Art Gallery, if you know the Northeast, you'll know that that's, you know, the face of Gateshead. Um, but we also had the, the more usual suspects, the head of Gateshead Housing, um, Alison, who sits both at the senior level with Citizens Advice Gateshead, but was at that point seconded to the council to run their poverty programme. Um, the head of public health, right hand lady, was on there. And that, though, that group of people joined, listened to the stories at the launch event for the lived experience and then joined us to form Get to Poverty Truth Commission. That in and of itself, I think, is quite a radical act. Um, and I'll come back to that later, just putting people in the same room who often are told they're at opposite ends of society. Um, although, of course, and I'm sure this will come as a surprise to very few of you, is that it turned out there was an awful lot in common um, between those people. And that actually is, we were on Zoom because you might have noticed we, I said we had our launch event in March 2020, we went straight into lockdown. Usually Poverty Truth Commissions exist in a circle of chairs with lots of food to share. And that's really good for getting to know one another and looking in the whites of each other's eyes. But actually on Zoom, that was the same. We laughed loads. We had beautiful stories. People were really open and honest with each other. Um, and for me, that relationship building is a really important part of the Poverty Truth Commission. But um, we also started to do some work together. We found three different themes that we wanted to work on and we broke into task groups that started to deep dive into some of that work. Um, and I'll come back to the bits of work that we did in a bit. Um, and at the end, we Poverty Truth Commission's a finite process. They don't go on forever. Although I like to think that some of the relationships um, that were built there will continue. Um, 
And so we had a celebration event at the end, and then we came to a close. And that is, in a nutshell, what a poverty youth commission is. Um, before I come to what we achieved together, I suppose I'd like to offer why we thought a poverty youth commission might be good for Kate's head. Um, and the first thing I would say was that nothing in Gates had seemed to be changing, that we knew the people in power were often saying the right sort of things and really seemed to have um, people experiencing poverty in Gateshead, of whom there were an awful lot at the heart of what they were trying to do, but it wasn't working um, until we wanted to try something different. And actually doing something different made a lot of sense to us when it came to a Poverty Truth Commission because we were hearing so much wisdom from the people that we were meeting in the food bank or at the local support group for women who'd experienced domestic violence, um, or some of the um, people who were negotiating with Jeff, who were receiving services from different charities in Gateshead, these are the places we found that people have this experience. And as we spoke to them, we knew that they had some of the answers, but that they just weren't being heard. And the third reason that we ran a Poverty Youth Commission in Gateshead um, it's about the theology of listening to wisdom from the margins. And actually Poverty Truth Commissions aren't Christian endeavors. They're often hosted by organizations that have got nothing to do with the church. But in Gateshead, they were, it was hosted by the Methodist Church. And for us as followers of Christ, it just seemed like in the bones of what it means to be a Christian, to be looking to the margins for wisdom and for leadership. Um, for lots of different reasons and I'm not going to try and unpack those because I'm not a theologian but that might be something that we could do in the discussion groups and um, so that's why we ran a poverty youth commission and I can honestly say that it was one of the best things I've ever been involved in and it's shaped not only the way that I work but I think like who I am as a person um, and when I look around the people who are involved um, I think it did the same for them and that's one of the things that I'm proudest of achieving in Gates of Poverty Truth Commission is that we all came out changed and that's just the power of relationships. Some of the most obvious changes are for the people with lived experience who are part of it. <laughs> PJ, who is a Poverty Truth Commissioner, rang me up the other week and said, Lucy, I'm just staying at the Crown Plaza. I said, oh, why are you staying there? He said, I'm speaking at an international conference. Um, and he, when I first met him, he'd it, I met him at the food bank and asked him if he wanted to be part of the Poverty Truth Commission. And then he didn't have enough pennies to rub together that he walked the four miles to where the Poverty Truth Commission was in the pouring rain to meet with us. Um, and now he's doing a bit of work with Newcastle University about how they can incorporate lived experience into their research. He's behind being paid and speaking at conferences. And um, that's not an unusual story for people who are part of Poverty Truth Commissions. It's not something we'd have a promise people. We never say come and be part of this in order to stay at the Crown Plaza. Um, not that I've stayed at the Crown Plaza myself, still waiting for that invitation, um, but it's actually, it's a really big deal. And it happened on both sides. I knew that also there were changes for our civic and business commissioners in the way that they work and in the way they walk about life because they'd really got to know what poverty looks like in Gateshead, not in the way that we um, hear about in the news, not even in the way that we see on uh, Ken Loach films, but in the way of building relationships with people who know that stuff. Um, and that's bled into the way that um, poverty is um, policy around poverty is made in Gateshead. We made bits of policy change in Gateshead together. I was really proud of some of that, some of that stuff around um, council houses and the state they're left in. Um, once one tenant's gone and another moves in, as part of the Poverty Truth Commission, we reshaped all of that. We've made really radical changes. And I'm really proud of that. But also, Gateshead Council now talk to and get to Poverty Truth Commission when they're in, making new policies and ask, ask us, does this sound right? Who should we talk to about this? Does, is this making sense? Um, and that for me is the beginning um, of getting this stuff right. Um, for example, Gates Council got a bit of money um, to tackle the rising cost of living and worked with us as Gates of Poverty Truth Commission recently to make something called warm spaces, which are community spaces. They're gonna be really warm and have cups of tea and coffee and meals. And I'm also a bit of signposting. So that's where we are in Gateshead. And um, Gates of Poverty Truth Commission for me started as an idea that seemed right. And um, on reflection, ending it, it, it is done right by the people of Gateshead. But I suppose some of the things that I'm reflecting on, um, I'm going to leave to you to have for some questions. Because I think in this group, you pose questions, aren't you? And break, going to breakout rooms to answer them. 
So I've got three questions. I'll ask them and then I'll post them in the chat so you don't have to make a note of them. Um, although I presume the chat follows you to breakout rooms, I don't know, you might need to copy and paste yourselves. But the first question <clears throat> is this, um, I don't believe that every community in the UK has the capacity or indeed the need to run a Poverty Truth Commission, but I do believe that every community needs to learn to listen to those at the margins. And I would love to know how you think we can do that well. My second question is, um, I think increasingly we're waking up to the fact that we need to listen to those at the margins, but the beauty of a Poverty Truth Commission for me is that's relational. It's not antagonistic. So my question would be, how do we build relationships between those in power and those at the margins, not just host antagonistic conversations? Although I'm not saying there's never a time and place for that because we have plenty of those within Poverty Truth Commissions and it, they've, <laughs> they speak things along and it makes stuff happen because where there is oppression, there's also anger. And I think there's an aptness in that. Don't worry, I've written the questions down much more succinctly than I'm speaking them aloud. <laughs> and my third question is, um, do you think the church models um, what Poverty Truth Commissions are about, which can be captured in the slogan, nothing about us, without us is for us? And how could we do better? Then my three questions. I'm going to post them in the chat. And then I'm going to be quiet. Thanks, Lucy. Um, those are great questions. Um, we probably need a couple of days to answer them. Or a lifetime. Uh, but we've got half an hour. So um, I'll just give you a little while to uh, are they questions? Have you put them all in yet? Yeah, yeah. can you see them? Okay. Can Wait, Kate's not in. Thanks, Kate. Um, so thank you, Lucy. Uh, really great. Um, and I say great questions. Just a reminder when we go into the breakout rooms, um, it's a reflection space. So if you want to spend some time reflecting quietly, don't feel you have to fill the space. And the important thing in reflection is to listen as well as talk. Um, so um, there'll be four people or so in each group. So at any one point in time, three people have got to be active listening and one, pe one person talking. So make sure everybody gets a chance to, to do both. Um, so uh, see you all back in about half an hour. So there's a decent amount of time to... Uh, at least explore the questions. Uh, if anybody comes up with the answer, we'll find out when we come back together. So, okay.